This week, I'd like to start by thanking our patrons who suggested the episode topic for this week. Oh, some nice wee patrons. Yeah, thank you, patrons. If you'd like to become a patron, head over to patreon.com forward slash SciGuys. Hello and welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jamp and Luke Cutforth. Hi. Hello. This week, we're talking about DID. Did. Oh, <laughs> DID. Um, like, um... Di- dissociative uh, identity dissociative disorder. Di- 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 disorder. Is that right? Just uh, what you said was what Luke said was barely English. Yes, dissociative. <laughs> I actually half guessed that. But... <laughs> dissociative identity disorder. Um, wow, I did know that. Yeah, you may have you may have heard of it as multiple personality disorder. Uh, in popular culture, it has been shown many many times. In Split, in Fight Club, you may have seen it. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily the best representations, but we'll get into no. that at some point later on. That is what we're diving into today. Are you guys both ready? Yes. I'm very excited. Are you really? Oh, yeah. Because I, I, as I say sometimes, went medically crazy last year <laughs> and had all these weird experiences of being like crazy several year? different people inside of a brain. So like, I probably have some some understanding of this from an experiential point of view oh that's that's great we've got some first-hand evidence i was actually reading some of the symptoms and i was looking at like ticking them off like okay luke there we go (laughs) look i would not i I, 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 I did not i received a diagnosis of psychosis of psychotic uh, psychotic break i did not receive a diagnosis of any kind of thing like this but i did experience some things that subjectively i feel like they match up to this well weird thing to talk about but cool i guess it was this will be interesting so there's actually a broader spectrum of dissociative disorders have you guys heard of depersonalization or derealization disorder oh are we friends with dodie or not yes (laughs) (laughs) yes we've heard of (laughs) derealization i've heard of them mentioned occasionally from time to time that's so rude. Um, it's not rude. I, no, I don't mean that in a jokey <laughs> way. I mean that Dodie is very open about her experiences. That is and true. It's fascinating. No, she is very open about it. Yeah, I think she works with um, a charity as well. Um, mm. Do you know which charity that is? She works with Unreal. So she, yeah, she works with Unreal. Um, and yeah, like, as I said, there are there are more disorders uh, associated with dissociation other than just DID. Um, not DPD. Uh, derealization or depersonalization disorder is one of them. Um, But specifically dissociative identity disorder, um, it used to be known as multiple personality disorder until 1994 when it got changed, um, basically because Ah. they had a better understanding of what it actually was. And one of the things that's really interesting to point out about this is that there's a very big difference between the idea of um, multiple personality disorders and schizophrenia, because most of the time in our society, when we hear the term schizophrenia, we think we're talking about multiple personality disorder. And schizophrenia is not the same well, thing as multiple personality that's disorder. That's so true. Um, schizophrenia, actually, the the name schi- uh, schizophrenia, uh, schiz- mm. uh, the schiz prefix um, actually means split. So... Ah, right. So right. it does have an etymological basis for that. Well, it um, it, it does, but only because um, of a misunder sort of a, a misunderstanding of the of the disorder itself. Schizophrenia is less a case of dissociation and more of sort of paranoia and hallucinations and kind of delusions as well. Right. So okay. Yeah. As a as a as um as someone with DID, mm-hmm. you wouldn't necessarily hallucinate. Uh, you wouldn't hallucinate your alters, the mm-hmm. the other personalities. You, uh for instance, could, if you're schizophrenic, hallucinate someone mm-hmm. um, completely. Uh, so if you've, if you've seen the film A Beautiful Mind um, about oh, the yeah. fam- a famous mathematician um, who had uh, schizophrenia and completely hallucinated uh, another person, supposedly. Mm-hmm. I've only seen the film. Yeah, this is terrifying. I was reading about this fairly recently about um, the fact that even something like, you don't, it's not necessarily just um, schizophrenia. Like, so there's an aspect of psychology um, called schemas and schemas can allow you in really uh, schemas are basically um sort of false false beliefs kind of but mm. don't 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 like if you want to i'm not a psychologist but basically false <laughs> beliefs or life traps uh, traps you fall in in life and and supposedly that can cause you to hallucinate people as well 
like at the real extreme end is what i read somewhere again don't listen to me about anything <laughs> <laughs> bear in mind um I'm, uh, that's that is the that's the far end of hallucinations i mean mm. a hallucination could be just a, a simple auditory hallucination of thinking you might hear a voice or thinking that someone's following you but it can also get to the point of um thinking that someone is trying to control your thoughts mm -hmm. things like that that would that would fall under schizophrenia um did um is is different in that um there are sort of separate personalities um so dissociating isn't something that just happens within these disorders. You can say, um, for instance, when you're like sort of walking home or driving home, you can kind of find yourself at your door mm. without really considering how you got there, without really, really even being able to remember. Yeah, that's that is a case of dissociation. Obviously, that's a very um, that's 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 a case of dissociation in a healthy person. That's not ind indicative of a disorder. Um, right. Okay. So everyone could dissociate to some degree because, like, when I had my job working in hospitality i'd be driving to and from the same place every single day twice a day mm. and i would usually when i was driving i just wouldn't realize that i was driving yeah and i'd just be home and i'd like i just i don't remember any of that drive yeah that exactly do anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. isn't, it, isn't it very concerning you wake yeah. up in a hospital i but, don't know how i got but, here yeah. um yeah uh, uh, yeah so uh, dissociating is something that can happen to a healthy person in their normal life obviously it's a, it becomes a disorder when it's a, a chronic thing Mm -hmm. um and obviously uh, it isn't quite as simple as just right. daydreaming or not really paying attention um that that is an issue people kind of conflate dissociation with just not mm. not necessarily paying attention whereas yeah. having zoning um, out yeah having a dis yeah zoning out having a dissociative disorder is kind of different it's like having a detachment from your body or the world around you it, it's a case of kind of feeling like things aren't real the way that uh Dodie, for instance described it um, is feeling like she was drunk or sort of daydreaming through mm -hmm. a lot of her life, which mm -hmm. obviously isn't quite the same as just zoning out on the way home. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a similar way to kind of understand what dissociation is in a more average context. Yeah. So dissociation is the way that um, your mind can cope with too much stress. So during a traumatic event, you can dissociate. But uh, generally, that's that's where dissociation comes from, from stress. You're You're kind of... Um, it's it's a way of just coping with a lot of stress, so you kind of just remove yourself, remove yourself from it. Yeah. Yeah. So whilst anonymizing this story, I know somebody who was in a series of um, se severely abusive relationships, and she was telling me about this experience she had where she would um, be being hurt and would experience seeing her body from above her body like she was on the ceiling um like an out-of-body experience like an out-of-body experience in order and i assume that's because the experience is so traumatic that the brain sort of protects you the conscious experiencer from it if there's no mm. way out you may as well get out and experience it from some other vantage point mm. very strange story very strange yeah and i mean that is that is completely an example of dissociation so the experience of dissociation can last for a shorter time hours or days up to weeks or months dissociation is something that can happen with other mental health issues so with anxiety or depression you can have some experiences of dissociation but obviously there's a spectrum um of disso dissociative disorders so mm. um there's a spectrum of intensity but also um mm. from depersonalization and derealization um up to dissociative identity disorder there's there, there's kind of a range of them yeah and and just because you have um, an experience of dissociation doesn't necessarily mean that you've got a dissociative disorder, just in the same way that experiences of depression don't necessarily mean you have clinical depression. So I've, I've kind of got, um, I've got a description here of how it can feel um, for to have DID, like in it, um, the experience, how, how you can experience the symptoms personally. So apparently um, you might feel, um, okay, so one of the symptoms is feeling your identity shift and change. So that might feel like um, you're like that might physically feel like your whole self is mm. changing to something else. Uh, or you mm. can speak in a different voice or voices. You can use a different name, um, switch into different aspects of your personality um, or act like different people of different ages, um, genders, mm. uh, races. Um, and and a doctor might call that identity alteration. So, I mean, okay. it, yeah. So it's something you could be aware of happening. Yeah, you can even though you necessarily can't control it. Yeah, you can be aware of this. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's the thing. People seem to think that this is something that people are always unaware of mm -hmm. and can completely and or can control. 
and it that's not necessarily true so i mean generally people can people can gain some control potentially through therapy to um not shift into other personalities but it's not a case of oh i just i've decided that i'm going to be jimmy today and tomorrow i'll be jenny yeah, it's not yeah. quite as it's not nearly as straightforward yeah. as that and yeah people can be aware of shifting between personalities and you can potentially be aware of someone shifting between, between mm -hmm. personalities if you know them supposedly um and then there's also uh, apparently a symptom is a kind of a d difficult and also a symptom is apparently kind of having a difficulty in knowing what sort of person you are so you might like for instance not be able to define who you are as a person um feel like there are lots of people inside of you mm -hmm. um and that's uh, an example of identity confusion Mm -hmm. hmm. So to get into exactly what DID is, um, from the DS, do you know what the DSM is? Yeah. Do you know what it it's stands for? I don't know total, what it stands for. No. Uh, D, D, uh, no, can't remember. The di <laughs> So it stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, it's, it's this big book of all the mental disorders made by a team yeah. of psychiatrists yeah. or psychologists, one of them. It's it's like your mental health bible. It's ah. it's yeah. Basically every recognized mental health disorder is in there. Um is it globally recognized? Yeah. I mean oh, it's yeah, it's an okay. American so I I'm fairly sure it's American. Um but um, I thought it was strictly American but yeah, it um, has its it has its um opponents as in it is globe I, I suppose it's globally recognized in the field of psychiatry or psychology mm -hmm. which whichever one I can't remember. Um, but there are lots of criticisms of the DSM as well. Um, part, I mean, you can read a bit about the criticisms of, of the DSM in the book, uh, The Psychopath Test by John Ronson, um, because it essentially got, got people. Over. Yeah, he, he, there was this, um, it's a really interesting book, and it talks about how people who are, there was a guy who was sort of 16 or something, and he claimed uh, a psychopathy or claim some kind of mental problem to get out of a drunk driving charge or something like that um like a, a some bad thing but he claimed mental health problems in order to get out of going to prison then because they found out he did this they diagnosed him with psychopathy and went oh well only a psychopath would do that and then he was <sighs> diagnosed with psychopathy and be and then because he didn't feel like he was a psychopath because he could feel empathy for other people yeah. he was trying to make an effort to prove that he's not a psychopath and then people were going oh well trying to not be look like a psychopath that's a psychopathic trait and he ended up being hospitalized Cat 22 <laughs> for oh a very long gosh. time and may still be there i'm not sure because he was it, it, what's the try to get what, out of this what's the solution to that you act like charge, a psychopath yeah. they say you're a psychopath you try and act you not like a psychopath yeah specifically not act like one it's a cat yeah catch 22 <laughs> so i mean like the dsm it, i say bible bible isn't necessarily the right word i mean okay look it, it could be the right word there's the bible there's the quran there's the torah oh it's the bible for the field there's, like of the, that there's a dictionary thing, yeah. almost well, yeah. but i mean yeah there's a bunch of there's a bunch of different sort of texts that you could go from the dsm is what a lot of people go from um it's wasn't being transgender in the dsm for a while yes it was it yeah. was gender dysphoria was added, gender dysphoria it? yeah um so yeah i mean it's it's basically a big book of mental disorders um so that it describes uh dissociative identity disorder as a sort of disruption of i, I so it describes dissociative identity disorder as a disruption of identity characterized by two or more distinct personality states or experience of possession um so basically and, and also a key part of this is that also it can't be a part of necessarily a religious or cultural um ceremony because in some places, being possessed is a uh, part of, say, the religious experience or the culture. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't necessarily fall under DID. But, but effectively, hang on. In, in simple terms, having DID is having two or more completely separate um, personalities or almost people inside of you. So in your, mm -hmm. in your head, you can switch between sort of two or more different people. In, in the simplest terms, that's not the exact way that it, it, it's defined, but an easy, that's the easiest way to understand it. Yeah, such, the, the choice to switch might not be yours at some point. Yeah. Oh, abs absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You, you don't, it's not even a case, it's not a case of uh, turning the switch. The switch can flip itself. What I find so interesting about this is you say, like, it can't be part of, say, a religious thing, but 
is it not possible that the the idea of demonic possession, for example, was a, an early understanding or an early attempt to understand what we now call DID? I think demonic possession is probably a description of a lot of different mental health issues. I mean, if you think yeah. about it, you can say, oh, you're not praying enough. That's why you're depressed. You, oh, <laughs> you think the world's out to get you? That's the demons, isn't it? That's the devil on your back. So yeah, absolutely. Sure. I, I, could totally, sure. I could totally see um, a schizophrenia, um, DID, a, a lot of different disorders. All um, of these different things being lumped under the Throughout same history, thing. just being called, that, Demon. a demon's, a demon's yeah. got you. I just find it very interesting because, for example, like, um, be like there's a documentary called Being Bonkers um, <laughs> about the life of a guy called Andy Lee who was um, who was uh, sectioned for. I spoke to him for, fairly recently about about my experience. We had a little Skype call because he saw my video about it, and um, oh. he was telling in this documentary. There's this line in it where they they write down in their in their diagnosis of him they were trying to diagnose him with schizophrenia and they say we're not sure before they get the official diagnosis they write we're not sure if andy's strange beliefs are a form of schizophrenia or a result of his religious beliefs and it's like <gasps> why what like why do you make the separation between the two like not not to say that religion is necessarily false what i mean is is that like if if one person believes that um, the moon is made of cheese and has, this is a ridiculous example, but like one person believes the moon is um, actually a god watching over you and that's because of their religious beliefs and one person believes the moon's looking at them all the time and that's because <laughs> of a type of schizophrenia or a psychosis or some kind of thing. Why are those different things? Why are they different things? Uh, it's. I think that's a, that's a really interesting conversation. It's such a comp complex uh yeah it's such a I complex guess, one as well i guess the the religious one could be taught well that's the thing it's i think right. it's a case of necessarily believing things that are demonstrably not true um despite what others are telling you which again does kind of fall into religion but there is with schizophrenia there are sort of more physical markers for it it's it's right. not necessarily something that is completely mental. I think we can we can see some um, markers for schizophrenia. Well, but this guy I'm talking uh, about, Andy Lee, got falsely diagnosed with schizophrenia. It turned out he had um, it turned out he had multiple sclerosis, which is apparently often misdiagnosed <laughs> as schizophrenia, which is a weird thing in itself. That's MS got misdiagnosed as yes. schizophrenia. And according to this documentary, repeatable documentaries on Channel Four, MS is often dis misdiagnosed as schizophrenia. Strange, because they're totally different what? things. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to give people an explanation of what MS is, Luke? Um, it's an issue with the firing of nerve cells in the brain, as far as I'm aware. Multiple sclerosis, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so MS and a type of schizophrenia may be related disorders. Wow. Um, or schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis. Um, wow. Yeah. So th there are these crossovers between these two things. Um, so isn't that really interesting? Really it is strange. Really interesting. Weird. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that yeah, I, I, it's these it's these beliefs that are that are accepted as um sort of that are broadly accepted, and then beliefs that aren't broadly accepted. But it's 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 difficult because there is there is kind of a clear line. So obviously being schizophrenic doesn't just involve the sole symptom of mm. believing something that other people don't believe. There are mm. other symptoms, which would then be the difference. I think um, a, a delusion would be more characterized by... Of course, but well, if you are somebody who, for yeah. example, believes... Um, like, And this is not to say I'm not taking a stand here on which is the truth. But if you're somebody mm. who believes that God gives you signs in the universe of what you should do, well... A religious person would say that is God giving you signs of what you should do. And a medical person would say that you're hallucinating meaning on top of the world that's not really there. Uh, and like, I'm not saying which one's the truth. I don't know which one's the truth. None of us can really know what's the truth. But, you know, those are the same thing. You're experiencing something that other people can't see necessarily. And you're giving ascribing it meaning that may or may not be true. I think I think ascribing meaning to things. I think the difference is I think ascribing meaning to things is something that humans do 
anyway. Oh, of course. Yes. I mean, yes, that's what we are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we're very good. You draw a face on a rock and people and then smash the rock and people get upset because, yeah, yeah because you smashed that, you smashed that <laughs> rock. You had a face. Little rock. Exactly. But, um, I, yeah, I, I think, I guess, I'm oh, oh. Oh, sorry, carry on. So I, I think the, I think there's, it's a, it's a difficult one for me to sort of verbalize, but I feel like there's a very, not very clear. I think there is a difference between, um, ascribing meaning to something mm. and then the disorder of having delusions there is there is a difference there and while it's a difficult one to nest it's a difficult one it might be maybe a difficult one to kind of um discern uh when talking about religious beliefs um there still is there still is a line um and there still is a there still is like a sort of quite a clear difference even if it's hard to yeah. describe there. Well, look, I mean, I'm just I saying, think, look, I think the, so for I think example, the thing is that there it's... is a large crossover between the type of person who is diagnosed with schizophrenia and the type of person who is um, is a shaman in a in a um, traditional uh, tribal setting. Those are generally except like, as far as I've read, those are similar things. Being a shaman and being schizophrenic are similar things. Let's put it this way. There are delusions that you're allowed to have. Yes, that's what I was hoping <laughs> like, you say. Yeah, yeah. Look, we can we can it's say like the it's... idea of um, it's like the idea of uh, um, what's the word um, neurotypical. It's like what we call sanity is just the thing that's productive for the society we're in, and most people have it. It doesn't mean that it's objectively sane. But in the same way, so okay, say for instance, obsessive compulsive disorder. Some people mm -hmm. can have compulsions. Some people can be obsessive. Just because you're obsessive, so this is this is things. Let's say you're obsessive about cleanliness. If it's not negatively impacting your life, if it's not chronically negatively impacting your life or those around you, then it's not a disorder. So it's as long just as you're obsessive. functionally uh, hallucinating or functionally um, mad, for want of a better word, um, it's fine. Is, well, is that the official line? I think so it's difficult it, to class. If it's dysfunctional, then you could count it as a disorder. I think it's yeah. I think as a if it's a disorder, something has to be disordered. It has to negatively impact your life in some way. And so with something like DID, um, obviously, forgetting uh, chunks of your of your of your day, like not being able to recall who you are mm. as a person mm -hmm. due to trauma. Yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty much always going to be disruptive to your life. Um, whereas believing in God. Um, you, look, you, you could have people that believe in God just because that's what they're taught, and then you could have people that believe in God because they're delusional. Mm. Ultimately, there is there's no negative impact, there's no disruption to someone's life um, mm. between those two necessarily. So one of them might not get diagnosed. If if it was disruptive to someone's life, then it would be diagnosed as as them having yeah. a disorder. I think that's yeah. why. The, the I guess what I mean is that I was surprised that a psychologist or a psychiatrist <laughs> would make the line between religious belief and um, what they would call delusional. If somebody is admitted to a psychiatric hospital and they make this, this um, we don't know whether he's schizophrenic or if he has religious beliefs. That surprises me that a medical person would make oh. that, uh, that sort of statement. I think it's I think it's less of a case of oh if someone was admitted we would um we would do that I think it's more a case of well we're not going to classify um people we're not going to classify this certain group of people as having this disorder mm -hmm. because while you can say that the symptoms fit within the culture that's not the ca that's not necessarily the case mm -hmm. it, right. it's it's okay. a it's a it's a cultural thing I mean that that's that's just me um. That's me assuming. I don't. I don't actually know the reason, the the cold hard reason that we've not mm. that that's mm. not classified. But that that's what, what that's what I would assume. Mm. Um, I, it and just again, shows I'd, how murky the field of psychology is, doesn't I, it? Well, yeah. I mean, we know very little about brains, which yeah. is irritating because which we are so brains. Annoying. Yeah, right. You should know. You should. Because we are brains. Every now and then, I'd be sitting in. I'd be sitting in my lectures for um for my biochemistry lectures in university and they'd be saying so there's this this is what's going on within all this within all of these cells and i'm saying i am cells i should know this i shouldn't need you to <laughs> I should know me. this already i am doing this right now why do yeah, i not know yeah. how it's cells working? understanding cells it's so frustrating yeah. because yeah. i'm doing it all the time i can be sitting in an exam right <laughs> failing my exam because i don't know what my body's doing a cluster of cells failing a like, biology exam <sighs> 
Exactly. It's it's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, that is a that is a really interesting philosophical point you've made there. Look, what is the difference between um, what is the difference between uh, sort of disorders and what well, delusions and certain well, delusions beliefs? are acceptable socially? I'm not saying they are yeah. delusions. That's what the key point. No, is I mean, I'm not saying they are delusions, but they they will be considered delusions by a, a medical person. They could be, yeah, potentially. Yeah. I mean, I think there's 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 every chance as well that um, there is something we're missing. I mean. None of us are experts in mm. psychology. Um, Absolutely not. And, and, and another, none of us are experts in um, delusions um, from an academic standpoint. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Corey. Yeah. However, from experience. I felt so bad as soon as I said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, don't, you don't have to. I find it, it's just, it's a wonderful, it's a obviously a horrible experience, but also so valuable. You don't laugh, you'll cry. <laughs> No, I actually wouldn't. I find it so <laughs> valuable having having now that I have the privilege of being out of it, it's valuable to me, obviously. Mm. Yeah. I wouldn't undo it for the world. It was fantastic. Whilst also being the worst period <laughs> of my life. <laughs> Awful, but bloody I, terrible. The worst thing of my life was fantastic. Great. Right, wouldn't you want to change it for the world? Experiences change you, man. And that ex that experience was, was No amazing. regrets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and maybe you guys could talk about that. Uh, or maybe I'm just repressing it, and actually maybe. I want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> the cameras go off. Luke starts flooding. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, maybe. See you next week, guys. Hangs up. <laughs> so as I was saying, as I was saying, dissociative identity disorder is basically the presence of two or more split identities. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, or personality states that continually have power over a person's behavior. So mm. that's that's another key point. They have to have an influence over your behavior. They have to kind of almost be in control at some points. Right. Um, you, you, cause you can, you can maybe feel like there's someone else inside your head. I don't know if it's necessarily classified as DID unless, um, one of those personalities kind of takes control. Um, yeah. At some sure. point. Yeah. So there's also, um, you can not recall, um, personal information that you should be able to recall, um, potentially sort of your name, where you were born, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and it's more than just forgetfulness um, mm. because it, it would be a case of, again, it effectively being a question at, asked of a stranger mm -hmm. um, rather than being asked about yourself. Does wow. that make sense? So it's almost like those sections, when you are this other identity, you don't have access to the biological, bi biographical information of the other well, ones. Potentially, not necessarily. I, again, this is, it, it, this is such a broad disorder that I can't, I can't, like, yeah. you know... Um, uh, equivocally say no this one with this yeah, disorder yeah, yeah. can can remember any facts about any of it no some of the personalities can interact with each other some of them can know each other from the videos that i've watched um i mean before even prepping for this uh people can be aware of the be aware of the other personalities yeah, yeah. um some of them can have uh, relationships with one another um it's it's, it's a very interesting sort of it's a very interesting thing two different alters could have a relationship not not necessarily a relationship like that, as in oh, they can right, okay. they can know oh they can know like, and interact with it, with each other. But yeah, it's such a it's such a complicated um, disorder that we don't actually know um, that, that much about it. We don't know everything at all, so it's very difficult to say anything with absolute mm. certainty. Mm. And again, not everyone experiences it the same way, uh, and that's mm. the thing with brains. Um, not everyone experiences say depression the same way, and not everyone experiences uh, there there are a range of symptoms. And you, yeah. you have, if you have a certain number of them, you, you have the disorder, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got all of the symptoms or all of the symptoms in the same intensity or all of the symptoms at the same time. It's kind mm. of a, a grab bag and it's really difficult to quantify. Yeah. So switching um, is a term used to, uh, to, to describe, um, get this, switching between the different alters. Mm. Um, it could take seconds, just minutes, up to days to do. Which is which is quite interesting. I mean, you would think yeah. that a lot of people seem to think that it's uh, an, instant an instant change, thing. but it could be more gradual. Um, yeah. So, I, I, and like I said, uh, it can't be because of a normal part of a broadly accepted cultural or religious practice. So that that it can't really be done. if if it's happening because of uh, a religious say event or mm -hmm. some kind of cultural some kind of cultural ritual. You wouldn't like have people to speak in tongues. Yeah, you wouldn't classify that as as DID, um, probably because it's it's societally accepted <laughs> and therefore yeah. it's not necessarily a disorder. Um, 
Yeah, so what do you guys think the causes of DID might be? We've touched on it briefly. I was going to ask this earlier. Do we know of any like actual biological causes for this? I would like guess whether trauma. it's genetic or like hormone, like that's kind of trauma. It was, so we don't know. Um, most basic, but I mean, yeah, yeah trauma is a good one. We don't know. We don't necessarily know the exact cause of it. Trauma mm. um, is the most likely. Is the most likely thing. Um, there are lots of different factors, but I mean, a lot of people with DID have had um, physical, verbal, sexual abuse during childhood. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, trauma as a trauma, particularly as a young child, is really kind of um, is is really linked to um, DID. So that's kind of the most common cause. Even though we don't necessarily, it's not even it's not like say mm -hmm. Alzheimer's or schizophrenia where we've got some we've got some idea of say genetic um, markers for it. With DID, mm -hmm. I, I, as far as I'm aware, we we've basically got trauma, <laughs> and that's that's about as much as we know about it. And would that be because it's like a protective barrier between the person and the trauma, or is it because it's like damage? Yeah, I would only say by the trauma. Or this is speculation on my part, obviously. But I, yeah, true. I from from what I from what I understand, it's a case of um, it's different from case there are, to case as well. Yeah, there, I mean, there's different ways to there's different ways to protect yourself, um, and the brain has different ways of dealing with trauma. So, what you have from a psychological point of view, and again, not a therapist, not, but this is my understanding of it. I'm an expert. Is you have aspects of your brain that your brain actually doesn't you're not one complete whole you're lots of different sections lots of different sort of departments that deal with things in different ways and you have for example you have three sections called parent child and adult and they have different roles and child is there to um to sort of enjoy things and be creative and parent is there to uh the parent and adult i forget the specific um sections but they're kind of like one's there to be your parent and to sort of um tell you what's good for you and what's bad for you and like kind of um if, you, if it gets damaged by trauma then it becomes scorning it becomes a scorning parent and then adult is there to sort of watch over and I'm, I'm probably butchering these definitions to a certain extent but the key point there is that if these things get damaged by trauma if you are a damaged brain by psychological experiences then those parts of you become um dysfunctional and your child part of you becomes very um scared and guilty and all these different things and your adult part of you becomes very sorry your parent parts of you become very scorning and mean and they talk to you in the third person and so that's what happens in these traumatic situations you have these centers that are um, meant to be functional and in a functional person you live in a really quite positive state but um when horrible things happen to you they stop being able to to do that mm. and it breaks down and you you experience all these horrible things so it may be that's sort of more, more of like a like it's, it's a more broad thing but I, I don't know how that would tie into specifically did so but that's an example what you what you touched on there is um experiencing trauma and that affecting you and then when you experience other um stressful situations um kind of going back to the way that you dealt with that trauma so that is actually that is actually sure. a recognized thing mm -hmm. um that that could be that's i mean ptsd um an innocuous situation that um is stressful in some way can have your body react as though it's going through a a, a traumatic experience yeah, like, like it yeah. was before car door slam if you're in war yeah exactly i mean i mean i mean flashbacks are something that's it's in it, it's shown in tv and movies as being something that's um like you what like them watching a video of it or whatever i mean i don't know if either of you guys have experienced flashbacks but I, I have a couple sides. Yes. And I'll say it's. it's I had a flashback yesterday. Really? Did you? Did you? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not Won't it's not a pleasant experience for. at all. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I mean, it's 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 not a it's not a pleasant experience at all, and it's 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 very it's very odd because your brain kind of doesn't really know what's going on. It almost shuts out. Hmm. It shuts out what it's actually experiencing around it, and just goes right back into where it was in that traumatic event and yeah. so the thing with did is if a child dissociates to deal with this experience that they're going through then when they start mm. having stressful situations throughout the rest of their life they could then fall back on dissociation as a way to deal with that stress mm. um and and that would then that would then create um a, a person with a did so that's kind of what the disorder is i mean broadly it's 
I don't want to say multiple multiple personalities, but broadly, it's effectively having more than one person kind of be in control of you, mm-hmm. um, and not necessarily being able to control um, which which alter that is. It um, sounds as though um, that the uh, an aspect of this is that they. So if we are, as psychology, as psychiatry tells us, um, sort of made up of different centers of the brain, we're not one thing, we're lots of different things um, that kind of vote on what happens to a certain extent. Um, it sounds like in DID, that's, those separate centers have become so dysfunctional and so like, um, like, I don't know, not trusting of each other or like that one of them decides to take control. And then when that one can't remain, con- remain control anymore, another one takes control. And they're like at war of, over who gets to control the body. Yeah, I mean, potentially, yeah. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to sit and outright say, yeah, that's what's happening. Because, mm. I mean, we don't know. I don't know. And I mean, n- no one really knows right now. That is, Annoyingly. I mean, that's an interesting hypothesis. Um, but I can't say one way or the other how accurate it is necessarily. Well, it's like the um, it's like the the Jungian idea of the shadow, which is that if you try and repress something, then eventually it will burst out of you. And so, like, if you try and have a like repress an aspect of yourself, then at some point that aspect of yourself is going to get fed up and burst out of you and take control. And that's not yeah. the same thing as DID, but it's like that that's a an aspect of that I have a certain level of reading on. Mm. I mean, I, I I mean, absolutely, it's it's. It's a very complicated. Um, it's a very complicated thing to talk about, especially because it. I mean, as I've said already, it's it's different among different people. So mm. one person could tell you their experience, and it could be completely different from another. Um, just on to treatment, there is no cure for dissociative identity, identity disorder, and I say that with quotes. There is no cure, um, but obviously treatment can be um, effective. <coughs> so you've got um, because there's there's not actually a sort of medical like a physical medical cure as in there's no medicine that you can really take um to help you with this um so it's generally psychotherapy hypnotherapy and something called adjunctive therapy Mm. so Mm. adjunctive therapy is sort of um art or movement therapy um and that can apparently help people connect with the parts of their mind that they've just shut shut away um so effectively what people do is shut off say a part of their a part of their mind um to to just so they don't have to deal with the trauma Mm. Mm. and there and basically what these therapies try and do is let people work through that trauma and reconnect with themselves so that the trauma isn't something that um affects them in in the way that it does in the way that it originally does takes over yeah exactly so psychotherapy is talking therapy um basically like i said it it works through whatever triggers um the, the sort of did um and in, in that case, you kind of meld the personality traits into one whole personality hmm. that can control the triggers. Um, apparently, in, in this case, you would include um, potentially family members as well to help hmm. with the therapy. Uh, hypnotherapy, it's its what you think. It's it, it, its getting people into a, um, a sort of hypnotic state, hmm. um, a, more, um, a more suggestive state. And apparently in that... Did a documentary that, on that? Sorry? Did a documentary on that. It's did you? Did as well. Oh, yes, yeah. so you did. Yeah, did yeah. as well. Yeah, fascinating. And and supposedly, um, what what happens there is you can um kind of bring out personalities that would be more, um, that would be more suggestible, um, so they can they can okay. they can also help people access like memories that they've repressed, but also mm-hmm. um other personality or mm-hmm. the personality traits mm-hmm. can kind of come out oh, and be more right. suggestible to what right, the right, hypnotherapist right. is um saying, which is interesting. Oh my God. There's a form of what I think sounds like that, but it is uh, it is one of these sort of woo woo y um, pseudo scientific aspects of mm. um, treatment, which is called QHHT. And I'm sure anybody who is doing psychology or psychology would despise the fact that I've mentioned this. It's called <laughs> quantum healing hypnosis technique. I and love, the, I love the word it's quantum. Where, it's it's yeah, not the one like where quantum. people use their. <laughs> it's not the one. It's not the one where people use energy in their hands to. I don't think so. It's it's okay. it, the the purpose of it, as far as I've read, is just to get somebody into the into a really low down sort of um, state where the person who's doing the healing 
can speak directly to some aspect of the person and that aspect of the person knows them really well and maybe is beyond any kind of from a psychological perspective i assume this part of them that they're trying to talk to is is beyond any kind of repression and beyond any kind of other things that are going on um and it's sort of a deeper state of the brain i don't know how it works i don't know if it's all crap but there's a lot of very positive testimonials about it but it's not part of mainstream medicine mm, interesting so the thing to watch out with with testimonials and things like that is that um i was actually watching this um this sort of video the other day that that talks about sort of pseudoscience and how it can trick people into thinking that it's true and i'm not saying that this is that this is what they're doing but it's often placebo. well no i mean kind of what often what people do is they'll they'll um if you look at sort of um anti-vaxxers and you look at people that believe it like um gwyneth paltrow mm -hmm. and, her, and her whole goop thing and that um quantum like goop energy that. healing all of that business they tend to target people that are slightly more educated um rather than people that are way less educated and if you see you see that in anti-vaxxers as well because they take a bit of knowledge that they've got mm -hmm. right. and they and yeah. they and they make it sound like it so for instance um with anti uh, with so there's there's one there's this one thing where this guy uses um his hands um to heal people with energy um and he says well your body's got energy in it um and if you know about the quant if you know about the uh the dual slit experiment um we can like we can turn um light from a wave into a particle um with my hands <laughs> well, yeah but like by observing it we can turn light from a wave into a particle um sure. so therefore we have control over energy and therefore i can control the energy in your body to heal you from whatever whatever illness and wow yeah you, you know the thing power. is you're building on something there you've got it and if someone has got a vague understanding they'll be like that doesn't sound wrong. I've heard of that experiment. But is that yeah. not, I mean, just as a playing devil's advocate here, is that not, <coughs> to a certain extent, like, it is like the placebo effect in and and the, um, the kind of use of kind of technical sounding jargonistic crap is is sort of playing to your rational brain that, that thinks that. So it sort of gets out the way so you can actually speak to the part that's hurting, which is not necessarily the rational brain. Um, so, just trying to because at the end of the day, if the placebo effect works, fine. Like, effect. But this wasn't, this this is this is less of just mental issues and more physical ailments as well. And I think I I, like, I mean, fair but enough. Physical ailments like, can be f f healed by the placebo effect. Yeah, no, absolutely they can. I just feel like if you're relying on the placebo effect, then uh, maybe don't. <laughs> I, just, I I think misleading pe misleading people and making them distrust science and medicine in order to in order I to think use they the believe it too. I think they believe it, the people doing this. Oh, I mean, they, if they do, then yeah, I mean, So it's fair not enough. misleading them. <laughs> They're just as stupid as the client. I, <laughs> I just think that, like, look, ultimately, if you're going to trust a, if you're going to trust a treatment, it should probably be something that is rigorously tested. These so often are not. Um, and that's, that's the issue. Um, I would say be careful of anything that says that there's good testimonials or that... Um, uh, there's a lot of good like um i mean even reviews or mm. people have said a lot of good things because what that means is that it's not been in a peer-reviewed article necessarily <coughs> and the reason that we trust peer-reviewed articles is because there are there are levels of checks in place there to make sure that the people that are um claiming that what they've done has worked actually have evidence to back up what they're saying whereas a testimonial could be someone that's had the treatment saying yeah, that worked for me. Worked great. I feel better. Uh, we don't know how many people say it didn't work. We don't know how many people they, they tested. We don't know yeah. actually what they did. So um, I'll just be careful when, when, looking at, uh, when looking at treatments like that. Um, so that's basically an overview on DID. I want to tell you guys a little story about someone called Elena. So in 1930, uh, there was an Italian psychiatrist named Giovanni Enrico Morselli. Um, wow. Mm, yeah, thank you. Are you Italian? A little. Oh, well, I dabble. Um, so he basically um, described this uh, this patient that he had called Elena. Um, Elena is one of the most famous cases of sort of published DID in, in history, uh, one could say. So the interesting part here that I just want to tell you about is that she had two distinct personalities, one of which was French speaking and one of which was Italian speaking. Wow. Ah. Yeah, and neither of them knew of, knew of each other. Um, 
it, it turns out that um, it, it turns out that she did have trauma in her past um, that kind of led to the disorder. But um, yeah, two completely separate personalities that knew nothing of each other that spoke completely different languages. But so, they shared a body. Yeah. So, and did they have two different lives with two different sets of friends? Well, see, she was so she was in um, no, she was in a she was basically in an institution. Um, right. Yeah. So that would have been cool. If she had, like, obviously horrible as well. But if she'd had two sets of friends and two different lives and two different jobs and didn't know that she was doing both of them, that'd be fascinating. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, I mean it's a potential. Netflix would have made a series about it by now. They Netflix would have done, wouldn't they? they? Yeah. yeah, and that that's the thing. I mean, this is the kind of, this is one of those cases that you see more often in um, in pop culture where wherein the, the identities know nothing of each other and they're completely different. Um, and yeah, that can happen. But then the issue with the pop culture has is that it says, ah, yes, and now these pe these people are violent because of it. They're violent and dangerous, which just yeah. isn't true. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's one of those things where people will say people with men mental health disorders or mental health issues are um, violent and more likely to commit uh, violent acts and are dangerous. When in reality, people with mental health issues are more likely to be the victims of yeah. violence. Nah, it's, it's those psychopaths that run all the global companies. Those are who you need to worry about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so there's this story from... Um, it's like a... Sorry, just quickly. Um, it, the way that's described is like, um, like werewolves in Harry Potter, mm. where they are outcasts in society, and even a character like Ron that we like goes, get away from me, werewolf! And then we become friends with Remus Lupin and we're like, oh, wow, he's just a, a person with this thing going on. It's a mm. lovely metaphor. Yeah. I think it was supposed to be a metaphor for AIDS originally. She didn't really... Well, it's it? a metaphor for anything that... I mean, yeah, I'm sure it's yeah. a metaphor oh, specifically, I, but anything that is socially unacceptable that, but actually is a thing you're suffering from. No, it, yeah. it was... Yeah. It, it is a good metaphor. And then <laughs> J.K. Rowling just smashes it with a hammer. Just kept going. Um, yeah, I mean, she's... She's very she's very good at what What'd she does. She do? Fender at Greyback. Oh. What do you mean? Why is that smashing it with a hammer? He was infecting kids intentionally. But there are people who deliberately infect people with HIV. What I'm saying is that you you've got two you've got two examples of um what I mean realistically, you've got two example two named examples of werewolves. One of them um infects children and the other one is a nice man. And then all yeah. the other non-named examples are also live, on Voldemort's live in side. The sewers or something. Yeah, yeah, they all live. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, fair enough. They live in forests and and you know <laughs> and and all of that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I'm saying that it's it, at the fa on the face of it, it starts off as a really lovely metaphor, <laughs> and then J.K. Rowling does her usual thing. Oh, come on! I think that's all right. <laughs> okay, fine. that one I think is all right. I think she did a pretty good job. Because at least we're introduced to him as this really lovely, wonderful man mm. who we then find out is a werewolf. We we don't even know for the mo most of the part for the first book or the third yeah. book. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, not for... Uh... It's just like, hey, you know this character you like? He has a thing that he's struggling with and society hates him for it. And, you know, he's lovely. He's the same lovely person you always knew. Yeah. Cool. Great. He's lovely. actually quite a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... um, uh. So Elena, uh, as 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 we were talking about Elena, the, this woman from the 1930s, um, she was playing. There was one night apparently she was playing um, a, a piece of music, yeah. um, and so th she then went to bed after playing the piano, um, and she was speaking in um, she was speaking in French at that point. She wakes up the next day, um, and under her pillow there's a half written note from her, to her father, but she doesn't remember writing at all. Um, and she says to one of the attend uh, one of the attendants, one of the people working in the institu institution, "I've got this. I've got this song stuck in my head." Um, and this is in Italian. She's saying this. And I've got this song stuck in my head. And I have no idea where it's come from. And the and the person working in the hospital is like, "Well, it's one of the patients was playing the music. This like this song last night. Oh, was playing some songs last night on the piano." Um, and she says. She said what song the, the patient was playing. The patient obviously still being Elena. Yeah. Um, and then Elena doesn't believe her, thinks that she's mocking her. Um, and then it's that, at that point that she finds the letter to her father and she just has no idea what's going on. So she's got this song stuck in her head. The attendant knows which song it is. And also she finds a half written note to her father that she doesn't remember writing because she's got this sort of other personality that's still 
in there a bit because obviously yeah. she remembered hearing the music, which is which is insane, especially because she's switching between languages as well. Yeah, I mean, and uh, one of the and the the French speaking personality supposedly um, thought that she was speaking um, French when she was speaking Italian. Oh, sorry. So the French speaking personality supposedly thought she was speaking Italian when she was speaking French. Wow. And so oh. did this? Did she? Did she ever have any kind of um, reconnection with these two parts of her? So yeah, she. That's the thing. Because um, that's a little thing where you go, oh, this is not the world telling me that that I have this thing. This is I am experiencing this in my head. I'm hearing mm. something, a song stuck in my head that I supposedly played, and so, that's like that can be one of those things where it's, it's like refuting. The, it's evidence that's irrefutable. Supposedly, she recovered fully from the symptoms. Wow. Which is wow. It must be insane to. I mean, how does that feel as a? That, that's the thing. It's hard to understand because are the different personalities full, complete people? I mean, I mean, they effectively must be. And then, how does that feel to be yeah. merged into one or to be almost purged or it, how? What is that experience as does another one die or do you re- do you both retain? Do you both get each other's memories? Did they merge. Or yeah. maybe it's something like you might have not seen Steven Universe, but from Steven Universe, where gems fuse and they become um, not a sum not just a sum of their uh, some of their parts but more I'm than a sum more of their powerful. parts well <laughs> she knows, not... she knows japanese as well <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's like it's like um you know 1 plus 1 making 2 not just two ones you know right it's sure. a, it's a different number um yeah I, yeah i mean it, that it, sounds to me from a very crude understanding Sounds to me possible that the the sum of the two parts could be greater than the than the two individual parts because presumably, if this is some way reflected structurally in the brain, each part doesn't have access or has limited access to certain centers of the brain. So when both gain ac- full access to all of the brain, they both gain abilities or understandings or insights or ways of thinking that they previously didn't have access to. I mean, look, like, um, potentially. Um, it, it is it is a really it is a really interesting um thing to study, and I I want to look into this more um after this episode. In fact, we might even do a second episode where we go more in depth on this because it I would is, love yeah. to do it if if anyone would be willing to an interview or, or to speak to somebody who has has had this and has mm. recovered who could share with us the insight that they experienced. Well, that's the thing. You people might not people uh, expecting recovery isn't something that will necessarily happen. Um. I mean, as as I've kind of said, it's not it's not necessarily just a case of therapy, and then you're good. You walk away from it. That can be the case. You can, um, you can recover from the symptoms, but then it could, um, it's not a guarantee that you'll definitely recover. Although, I mean, we could potentially find someone that has had symptoms and now doesn't, um, to interview, or even someone that still has symptoms, um, that we can interview. It'd be lovely. Yeah, that'd be fascinating. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so I've got some myths to bust Ooh. for you. Uh, myth number Please. one people with did have many personalities that they can just summon uh whenever they want like a party trick <laughs> yes like a party trick I hello think not look at me i am cory now, now i am I'm iraq switching. now, I'm now switching. i am cory <laughs> switching back and forth acting I think my fiance <laughs> might might do that actually so myth busting here uh the people with did um have sort of splintering of splintering of their identity rather than new ones completely forming out of nowhere. Mm. So it, it's not necessarily a case of um, a, a growing an entirely new person. It's splitting who you are into multiple um, mm. sort of right. segments of themselves. Mm. Uh, and for a lot of people with uh, DID, uh, switching is completely involuntary. And if you don't, if you don't know them, if you're, if you're just looking at them, you wouldn't necessarily notice at all. Mm. I mean, the thing is you can actually have different um, sort of, ways of holding yourself different gates yeah uh, even different languages different yeah. skills uh, among these different personalities but it not necessarily could be subtle things as yeah well. it could be Tones subtle of voice as well yeah and yeah. it could be something that someone just doesn't notice um myth people with did are dangerous or violent reality obviously people with did are no more likely to be violent than anyone else um and apparently there are a few cases mm. linking crime and did um and Despite what you may see in many films, an evil alter yeah. is just not something. It's not something that is like. Don't take scientifically split as relevant. A good example. Yeah, split is not 
No. I mean, Split also has um, it's it's linked to what Glass and Unbreakable. It's yes. got a man that uh, that drowns real is good, a, but is real strong and immortal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's no, not I, an impossibility, though, is it? I mean, an evil. I mean, I think having an evil altar is uh, as probably as likely as having an evil person. Sure, yeah. but there are evil people. I mean, are there <laughs> evil people? I mean, it's. Oh right, okay. Are there not? Are there not evil people? Right, fair enough. Maybe there aren't actually evil people. There are. Yes, everyone thinks they're doing right. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, like, it's it's not the case. It, what I'm trying to say here is there's not a, there's not really a case of people with DID uh, having one personality that's out to get everyone in the world. You know that they have to hide yes, or. Of course. Potentially, you could have someone that has that has that relationship with an altar, but not necessarily. It's not something that we should consider as being the yeah. norm or a standard, or even really think about when we're thinking about DID, mm -hmm. because right. you may as well you may as well think of someone uh, as having an evil twin, you know? Right. Yeah. It's an unhelpful <laughs> cliche that m generally paints the majority, if not all or nearly all, of the mm. people with this this disorder as something that they absolutely are not. Yeah. So I think the twin comparison is a really is a really good one. You wouldn't say that every single twin. Um, one of them is evil and the other one is good, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's ludicrous. So why do we think that um, with people with DID, it's just it's ludicrous. It. Is he the evil twin? Oh my Lord. Damn. Who's the good twin from ludicrous? Where's the evil ludicrous? Wow. Moving on, moving on. Um, uh, another myth is DID isn't real. People who say they've got it are just pretending. Obviously not true. I've just gone and told you all about, I I'm not even gonna get into that. Of course they're not <laughs> pretending. Um, uh, and another myth, uh, we covered this at the start, DID is the same as schizophrenia. They're very different. Um, schizophrenia is a psychotic illness, uh, so linked to psychosis, um, uh, where you've got delusions, paranoia, and hallucinations. Um, dissociation um, is different. So people with DID aren't uh, delusional and they're not hallucinating, hallucinating their alters. Mm. That's something that is like actually going on inside Part their head. Part of them, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, but that is DID. If you enjoyed that episode, please let us know. It was interesting. Yes, it was, wasn't That's it? scary because I don't like that we don't understand brains. <laughs> so this was voted on by our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash side guys. So right now we're going to thank every single one of them for you know, being a patron and kicking around. Do, 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 so do, do, first do. off, I would like to say thank you to Alexandra Tyan. I'd like to say thank you to Alice Blacker Loyalian. Uh, thank you to Anne. Thank you to Beth. Thank you to Brianna. Thank you to Clay Holly. Thank you to Ella Hellesy. Thank you to Eve. Thank you to Gaza. Thank you to George Farron. Thank you, Hiccup. Thank you, Krishna Riddy. Thanks, Landy Manderson. Thank you hey, to Krishna Riddy. Laura. Thank you, Lucy Levs Evans. Thank you, Luke Cutfer. Oh, you're so welcome, man. Thank you're you so to Marissa. Thank you, me, Standin. Thank you, Mia Jones. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Noah Nilsson. <laughs> Thank you to Omar Garcia. Oh, fuck. No. It didn't let me swipe. <laughs> I was like... <gasps> Thank you to Paul Olson. Thank you, Phoenix Wilkes. Thank you to Quinn Hall. Thanks, Rebecca Egan. Thank you, Rob Bruce. And thank you to Tobias Schaffel. Hey. Wow. Well, we got a lot of patrons yeah, now. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. 30 of us. That's insane. Oh, Thank wow. you very much. That's 30 patrons we've got now. I won't run you through all of the perks we've got, but there are some really good ones, um, including uh, a bonus episode every month and unlimited access to all, that is right, all of our live shows. So head over to patreon.com forward slash guys if you would like to join up. Thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday. And why don't leave us a nice wee comment? You can find and contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Or leave us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod. At gmail.com. I am not Corey everywhere. I'm Jamkin everywhere. I'm Luke Cutforth everywhere. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.